Please join me in singing our opening hymn this morning, When the Summer Sun is Shining. Thrum, 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 thrum. When the summer sun is shining over golden land and sea, and the flowers in the hedgerow welcome pleasure fly and be, and my open heart is glowing full of love for everyone, and I feel an inner beauty which reflects. Welcome to the Community Church of Chapel Hill Unitarian Universalist Virtual Sunday Service. My name is George Thompson, and I'm a member of the Worship Associates Ministry at our church. We welcome each of you to our Sunday online service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you came to worship with us today, you are welcome here. The chalice lighting words this morning are by Albert Thelander. We hallow this time together by kindling the lamp of our heritage. For a call to worship, we have some words that you may be familiar with, written by Pat Humphreys of the musical group Emma's Revolution. The words are from the chorus of their song, Swimming to the Other Side. We are living neath the Great Big Dipper. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together, some in power and some in pain. We can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will, leave, will live forever we are all swimming to the other side. Come, let us worship together. Hey there, hey. how are you? Um, I'm Brian. And I'm Lex. Uh, we're together in Neville's Quarter. Um, and this song is Gotta Love the Summer. It's appropriate with this heat wave going on this weekend. Oh my gosh. Thank you. 
barbecues on the beach and music that speaks. Fireworks just out of reach. Light my soul, take away my speech. Boats on the ocean that span by, watching sunsets from the dock. No need for a tick or a top. It's a magic time of year. It's got my heart on. summer guys each week we hold a time in our service for sharing joys and sorrows this past week I received several messages asking me to place stones for joys as well as for sorrows first stone that we placed this morning was asked to be placed by Amy Maddox Amy writes as we've been restricted at home during the pandemic, the Maddox family has taken on many pets. Some have been temporary pets, a baby mouse and a worm snake from the yard, chickens, which turned out to be roosters. But, Amy writes, Charlie's parakeets were intended to be permanent, but sadly, one of them abruptly died last week. Amy is, says they are sad, but also proud of Charlie's care for all of the creatures in the Maddox family. Jay Johnson asked me to place a stone for a sorrow. Jay has spent most of this summer on Cape Cod caring for his dying sister. He writes, she was 83. And I was very fortunate to be with her at the end. Because of the premature deaths of our parents and her husband, my sister Judy found other people and got to be a part of several families who all loved her. We hold Judy, Jay Johnson's sister, in our prayers. Marnie Goldschlag wrote yesterday asking me to place a stone. Her son spent Friday in terrible abdominal pain. After going by ambulance to the hospital and having tests performed, he underwent an appendectomy. And so we offer prayers of healing to Marnie's son. Glenn Merbach wrote asking me to place two stones for joys Glenn and Deborah's first and only child, Eden Klinger, celebrated their 25th birthday on July 17th. Happy birthday to Eden. And Glenn also shares that he and Deborah will celebrate their 28th wedding anniversary on Wednesday, July 22nd. Congratulations. I was asked to place a stone and say a prayer for Ruth Bader Ginsburg as she battles a recurrence of cancer. I was also asked to place a stone of gratitude in honor of the life of civil rights leader and Congressman John Lewis. With thanks for his life and 
his service. One more stone, a stone of joy, and the message that I received was, it is with great joy that Mary LeMay's daughters, Erica and Tracy, and their families, along with many friends, celebrate that Mary LeMay will celebrate her 80th birthday this week. Erica and Tracy grew up in the church, and to Mary's great delight, they've been attending our online services from their homes in Durham and San Jose, respectively, during the pandemic. Happy birthday to Mary LeMay. A final stone is placed this morning for all the joys and sorrows that we hold in our hearts that were not spoken. I invite you to join with me in a time of meditation and prayer, holding in our hearts all of the joys and the sorrows of this community, the sorrows, the loss of a pet, sorrow of the loss of a beloved family member, Concern for the illness of a loved one, as well to hold in our hearts the joys, the joys of birthdays and anniversaries. As we join together in prayer, let us hold in our hearts these words by Congressman John Lewis, appropriate to these times. Do not get lost in the sea of despair. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Our struggle, after all, is not a struggle for a day, or a week, or a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise or to get in good and necessary trouble. Amidst the prayers of our own hearts and the prayers which extend beyond our walls to this fragile and hurting in the beautiful world. We say these prayers and say together, Amen. This morning's reading is by Philip Booth and it's called First Lesson. Lie back, daughter, let your head be tipped back in the cup of my hand. Gently, and I will hold you. Spread your arms wide, lie out on the stream and look up high at the gulls. A dead man's float is face down. You will dive and swim soon enough where this tide water ebbs to the sea. Daughter, believe me, when you tire on the long thrash to your island, lie up and survive. As you float now, where I held you and let go, remember when fear cramps your heart what I told you. Lie gently and wide to the light year stars, lie back and the sea will hold you.
It's the middle of July. The days are long. The heat comes earlier in the morning and stays well into the evening. We have fully entered summer. In this strange and challenging year that we're in, some of the traditions of summer are on hold. Summer camps are closed. There's no cheering for the Durham Bulls. Travel plans for many of us are being postponed or significantly altered. And other summer traditions are going ahead. I know many of you are enjoying ice cream, watermelon, s'mores, grilling out. In our family, we've set up a slip and slide in our front yard, and you know I had to try it out. Of course I did. My sermon this morning is a meditation inspired by summer. In coming up with the sermon, I gave myself permission to reminisce and luxuriate in daydreams of summer's past. I invite you to do the same this morning. And as I closed my eyes and remembered, I was transported back to the summers spent in my hometown on the edge of Lake Kachichuit. That's a fun name to say. Working as a lifeguard and swim instructor at the town beach. You may not know this about me, but during my teenage years, I was a competitive swimmer. My race was the butterfly, as well as the individual medley, a lap each of butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle. I was a decent swimmer, but not great. I could qualify for sectionals, but my times were never quite good enough to hit the uh, cutoff mark for qualifying for the state championship and I spent the summers of my teen years lifeguarding and teaching swimming lessons. What I want to do this morning is ask in a fanciful way whether there might be a spiritual component or some religious significance to any of those swimming lessons I taught. This is a playful sermon, and so I invite you to play and imagine with me. This is a sermon about metaphor and analogy. When teaching swimming lessons to the youngest children, I'm talking about three-year-olds, one of the first things you do is work to get them all the way into the water. We would begin our classes by singing a lot of hokey pokey, leading them in putting their right leg and then their left leg and then their right arm and then their left arm and so on into the water and shaking them all about with joy. After that came teaching the very youngest children to fully submerge in the water, to get their head all the way under the water. We sang 
ring around the rosy and ducked our heads under when we got to the line all fall down. We sang Grand Old Duke of York, which culminated in frenzied jumping up and down and the ducking of our heads underwater. To learn how to swim, you first need to be willing to get all the way into the water. That's true for many types of learning, right? The best way to quickly learn a new language is to go live among people who speak that language. That's called immersion. So learning to swim requires immersion. Learning a language is helped by immersion. And it turns out that immersion is also a religious word. Got me thinking of the Christian sacrament of baptism. And some denominations do full immersion baptism. And I wonder, I wonder if some of the power of that ritual is that experience of immersion, that way of saying, I am all in. Wait, what might immersion mean for our spiritual lives or our religious lives? Have you ever had the experience of going all in, of fully immersing yourself in something? I once had a friend who loved the teachings of Jesus and the examples of Jesus's life, but who was intellectually mystified, baffled by Christian theology. Belief was this stumbling block for him that he agonized about. He went to go see a minister with this issue. What do I do if I don't believe? And the minister's advice was interesting. The minister's advice was not to worry about belief, just immerse yourself. Immerse yourself in living as a follower of Jesus. And the beliefs, eh, they'll either work themselves out or they won't. So he immersed himself in the work of feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, visiting the prisoner, healing the sick. This didn't lead him to have some epiphany about belief, but it led him to a place of equanimity of feeling like he had made a comfortable truce with his worries about belief. Immersion. To swim, you have to be willing to get fully into the water. I think of religious figures who immersed themselves fully in living their faith. Mother Teresa in Calcutta, Gandhi immersing himself in the work of freeing India from British rule. When is it in your life, you've felt called to go in all the way. After we taught young children to get their heads underwater came the next lesson, which was in many ways the hardest lesson. The lesson of teaching kids how to float on their backs. You have the child lay back in the water with your hands under them under their back for support. And then you slowly, slowly drop your hands away. And if the child is able to stay still and relaxed, they will float. Easier said than done. As a swim instructor, I had everything from kids who would grab my arms and not let go to kids who would shoot their legs and their arms and their heads straight out of the water the second I let go to kids who would panic and thrash. This lesson of learning how to float is more mental than physical. It is learning to be okay with that sensation of lying back, breathing with your mouth very close to the water, being comfortable with the discomfortable feeling of being in such a vulnerable position, and the mental task of trusting, trusting that you will, in fact, float in the water. Thinking back to this experience of trying to teach young children to float on their backs made me think of the exquisite poem by Philip Booth that George Thompson, our worship associate, read earlier this morning. First lesson describes a father teaching his daughter how to swim how to float on her back. It is about that lesson, but it's a metaphor for so much more. 
as you float now, where I held you and let go. Remember when fear cramps your heart what I told you? Lie gently and wide to the light your stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. A message from a father to his daughter, even after I'm no longer there to hold you, you will continue to be held. Such a powerful image. What do you think is the spiritual lesson within this swimming lesson? It's a beautiful poem and it speaks to something deep within me. And at the same time, it's one that I struggle with. This poem seems to be saying something about trust. Trust the universe. But I struggle with whether that's even true or ethical to say. Some of us find ourselves enveloped by a gentle current pulling us towards safety. Some of us find ourselves stuck within a vicious riptide pulling us toward danger. Perhaps it is most true, most true to say we find ourselves all the time in situations that are truly beyond our control. Sometimes the water we're in is still, and sometimes it's choppy. Sometimes the current is pulling us toward the sandy beach, and sometimes it is pulling us towards the rocks. Sometimes everything is just out of our own control. I'm interested in how you respond emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, when confronted with circumstances that are beyond your control. And I know that right now, right now, that's how things feel for a lot of us. That the world is out of our control. And I wonder what it's like, even in the midst of that, to lie back, to lie back and trust that the sea will hold you. There's a spiritual lesson of immersion. There's a spiritual lesson of floating. There's a classic sermon form in which sermons are supposed to have three points. So I'd like to introduce a third lesson from Swimming Lessons. I want to jump way ahead, way past the basics to the advanced class, which was teaching youth, teaching youth who were about to join the swim team, how to race the breaststroke. One of the toughest challenges in learning the breaststroke is to learn the timing of the stroke. When you learn the stroke, you think of it as having three beats. Pull with your arms on the first beat, kick with your legs on the second beat, and then glide on the third beat. And when I taught it, I would actually have the youth elongate the glide. Pull, kick, glide. Pull, kick, glide. And if you're on the swim team, the way to make the breaststroke faster is not to shorten your glide. You want fast, strong arms, a fast, strong kick, and a long glide. You can actually get a faster stroke by spending more of your time in the water gliding. You can actually get a faster stroke by spending more of the time in the water gliding. And this translates all the way up to the Olympics. If you watch a world record race in the breaststroke, the fastest anyone has ever swim that stroke. You'll see that their stroke is really fast and really powerful. But even then, even then, there is a moment of glide. A moment when they are fully stretched out and take a, even a short pause 
before the next stroke. I'll say that the fastest anyone has ever swum the breaststroke. If you go and watch the world record, it includes moments in every stroke, stretched out and pausing. In our own lives, in our own spiritual lives, there has been a lot that's been written and said about taking time to rest, taking time to recover, allowing time for stillness. The term self-care is extremely popular in the circles in which I run. I'll be the first to tell you, in all honesty, but I'm not very good at taking time off or taking time to rest. It's just not how I'm made. Do as I say, not as I do. And so I want to reimagine the glide, that pause, because I actually don't think it is a rest. What is the glide exactly in the breaststroke? Why is there that beat? As it turns out, if you have a strong pull followed by a strong kick, taking a moment to glide allows you to get the most out of the hard work that you've just done. It's not about resting for the next stroke, but it is about being able to kind of fully appreciate that hard work that you've just done. It isn't rest, it isn't recovery. The glide is a way of appreciating and honoring the work that you've just done, allowing it to carry you before you move ahead to the next stroke. What would it be like if we took the time to fully appreciate the journey that has brought us to where we are in our lives, to honor what we've put into it? Where is that glide for you? That's where my mind went this past week as I reminisced about being a swim instructor in my teenage years. And those are the spiritual lessons that came to mind in thinking about teaching children and youth how to swim. Immersion. You learn to swim by getting all the way in the water. And you develop a spiritual life, a religious life, by immersing yourself in it. Floating, lying back, looking up, being still, and trusting that the water will hold you is important to learning how to swim. This is also a spiritual lesson. Trusting and also admitting that there are things which you do not and cannot control. The tide, the current, the conditions. Gliding. Honor the work you've done and the effort you've expended by allowing it to carry you. Taking the time to honor, to really honor the journey that has brought you to where you are. Love hearing if you've had any connections between learning to swim and spiritual life. Until we talk, I say to you, stay cool, stay safe. See you soon. Amen and blessed be. This song's called It's a New Day. One, two, ready, go. <laughs>
Cherish this moment, let it fill your mind and heart. It's first not an option. Let's hope an opportunity and knock it. Let's take action and stop all the talking. Let's build each other up and put the courage in. When we hold an in-person service, we often end with a time of appreciation, a time when we applaud those who shared their musical gifts during the service, and a time during coffee hour when we can approach those who spoke during the service to say a good word and say thanks. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to George Thompson and to all of the members of the worship ministry who work with me to create the services we offer each week. I want to say thank you to Lex and Brian for sharing their musical gifts, as well as to all the members of our choirs who led us in the hymns. And of course, a great big thank you to Glenn for not only uh, organizing all of the music, but for creating the video of this service. I want to invite you to add your appreciation. And one way I invite you to add your appreciation is by making a financial gift to support the ministries of this church. Your financial gift not only supports our worship and our music, but all of the programs of this church, religious education, our programs for youth, our social justice programs, our fellowship programs, our learning programs, and so much more. If you want to give a gift to support the ministries of this church, you can do so by using the giving portal below. Thank you so much for your generous support of this beloved congregation.
Please join with me in the words by which we extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Now please join in singing Shalom. <laughs>